Um, so I, so I want to start everything uh, with just a, a, a one-minute clip um, uh, written by our, our special guest um, from the HBO show Treme. So yeah, let's do that. Cool. Hopefully the volume will, will work. Okay. Just follow your whole fucking car. You feel me? It's obsessive about potholes. Somebody's got to call these motherfuckers out. I agree. He's running for city council. You agree? Really? Jacques Morial, scion of a great political dynasty, agrees with me. Hey, shit is funny. Grease palms, brother. Pots and potholes, don't forget that one. It's satire, it's good. But you have a chance to raise some serious questions that none of these other motherfuckers are going to touch. I do. Look, looking ahead here, we got some serious challenges. We've got public housing, we got expropriation of people's homes, we got when they're gonna reopen charity hospital, we got this big nasty question about who can come home and who can't come home. Right. Here's an idea. Why don't you be my campaign manager? Not gonna happen. <laughs> but look, what I can do is I can hook you up with some real effective public exposure so we can get these issues on the table. And that's if you really want to kick it up a notch. Hell yeah! Go for it, Davis. <coughs> Do you really think I can win this? The election? No, fuck it. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was just checking. That's it. All right, great. <laughs> So uh, that scene, written by our guest author Tom Piazza, um, gives you just, just I think, uh, thank you, uh, gives you just the, the smallest sense uh, of his talent, his ability to capture human ambition, making something out of nothing, small but stinging disappointment, and the familiar strangeness of racial politics in the broadest sense of the term. It's also really funny uh, and appropriately, uh, delightfully uh, drops the f-bomb. Okay, so, so uh, I'll rewind now a little bit. Um, um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I have a more for formal version of that thank you, so let me read it. Uh, the Frankie seminars and lectures are intended to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience and to tie interdisciplinary undergraduate education to the work of distinguished visiting scholars. Endowed by Richard and Barbara Frankie in 2004, the series is organized each year in conjunction with an undergraduate seminar taught by a Yale faculty member or Yale faculty members uh, and develops a theme of broad interest in the community. These seminars form an important com component of the humanities curriculum, and we are grateful for the extraordinary support that the Frankies continue to provide uh, for these occasions. So thank you to them, and thank you to all of you for being here. Mr. Piazza is the author of an astonishing 12 books including the novels A Free State, My Cold War, and City of Refuge, along with uh, Devil Sent the Rain, Music and Writing in Desperate Times, Why New Orleans Matters, and Blues and Trouble, 12 Short Stories. City of Refuge won the Willie Morris Award for Southern Fiction, and his My Cold War won the Faulkner Society Award. Why New Orleans Matters received the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities Book of the Year Award, and Blues and Trouble won the James Mickner Award. Piazza is a richly, deservedly decorated author. Add to this a Grammy. Mr. Piazza received a Grammy for his album notes to Martin Scorsese, Martin Scorsese Presents the Blues, A Musical Journey. Uh, indeed, Mr. Piazza has been a longtime preeminent writer of American music, notably jazz, blues, bluegrass, and country. These writings as freestanding books, as articles in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and everywhere else, are, uh, uh, or, or, or part of larger anthologies, have earned him a whole other chest of awards. And of course, he was a principal writer for the HBO series Treme. Mr. Piazza went to Williams College, received an MFA in fiction from the world-renowned Iowa Writers Workshop, and he has been a writer in residence at several colleges and universities, including Hobart and William Smith Colleges and Loyola University. For the seminar that I teach with Crystal Feimster, New Orleans and the American Imaginary, we've read Piazza's City of Refuge, Why New Orleans Matters, and his short story, Brownsville. Uh, and we had a really wonderful uh, conversation with him before you all got here, so you're late, but it was great. Uh, uh, so here's the, the, the tiniest sliver of what memorizes and, uh, mesmerizes and, and moved us. Piazza conjures orbs of feeling in words that captivate completely, even or especially as they unsettle us. His words, his characters, his narratives, 
stun in their exposure of anguish, rage, disorientation, and those other emotions so hard to sit with, but so necessary to read with. In City of Refuge, drawing on metaphors of the body and human sensoria, Piazza's New Orleans is our friend, our lover. We are nearly the city's widow. And we come to love, long for, and root for the city, as we do the two families, black and white, who improvise their way to livable lives after the storm and the, and the grotesque failures of government uh, that followed at every level. And while some of the connective tissue across our, our classes Piazza's readings assembles loss, suffering, and the resuscitating of selves and communities alongside and against atmospheric despair, anxiety, and disposability, I want to also say Piazza can be really, really funny. Uh, I found myself uh, snorting in, so, in, loud, in loud, socially unacceptable laughter uh, at, at, at Jen's raunchy, beyond raunchy one-liners in City of Refuge and at Aunt Mimi's and Desiree's reposts in Treme. I'll hand over the mic with words from our author. Uh, in Why New Orleans Matters, Piazza responds to the question so often asked in fall 2005, usually posed rhetorically, with but the thinnest veil to cloak its racism, why should, we re why should we rebuild New Orleans? His answer is the right one, not only for the city, but also for all cities, for infrastructures, for knowledge production, for human invention. My answer, he offers, began with the notion that no city we know of would exist in its current form or any other form if it weren't for human efforts. Everything worthwhile that humankind has achieved involves a rearguard action against entropy. Without continual effort, it would all quickly revert to weeds and waste. Anyone who owns a house, tends a garden, raises children, shaves, or does just about anything else knows this to be true. We are always, in this sense, pushing back against nature. Please welcome Tom Piazza. Well, thank you. Joe, do you want your phone? <laughs> if I speak in a normal voice like this, you all can hear me? Yeah? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. And I'm so happy to make so many new acquaintances uh, and to see some old friends, old and dear friends. Uh, what a lovely occasion this is. Thank you. And I want to thank, oh, excuse me, I want to especially thank um, Joe Fischel and Crystal Feimster for making this all happen in such a graceful and gracious way. And Micah Cater uh, was indispensable and incredibly helpful. And so thank you so much uh, to those three and also to the generosity of Richard and Barbara Frankie. And uh, thanks also to the Whitney Humanities Center for hosting this. So the title of this talk I guess you've seen the title of the talk when it was advertised, is Improvising Identity, New Orleans and the American Dream. Uh, and I have to apologize in advance for delivering a lecture on improvisation from a prepared written text. It's, <laughs> sorry about that. But anyway, we'll leave time for uh, discussion at the end, hopefully. Okay. Um, so let me say that I deliver this lecture with a degree of trepidation. Um, I'm a novelist, not a cultural historian or ethnographer, or uh, not a polemicist, certainly, or even really an essayist. Um, as a novelist, I work in an arena in which opposites are almost always simultaneously true, uh, and in which the truth, such as it is, can't be formulated in discursive terms. So I always feel a degree of discomfort with discourse that is aiming toward a certain point, because I always almost, you know, as a trope, I kind of tack in the opposite direction almost immediately. Um, I want to say that the United States, like New Orleans, uh, contains staggering and often seemingly indigestible contradictions. As soon as you say one thing about the nature of New Orleans culture, much less American culture, it seems that the opposite is true as well. Um, I would say that both cultures not only contain, but are defined by the fact of their massive internal contradictions, which fact is almost impossible to engage head on 
without getting overrun by an armada of exceptions, qualifications, counterexamples, equivocations, mitigations, heavy theoretical artillery and sniper fire, outright evidence to the contrary, briefs for both defense and prosecution. Instead, in other words, of trying to offer a sustained argument leading to a grand point, what I will offer instead is a series of patrols into or raids upon uh, a territory of questions with no clear answers, uh, at the heart of which lies a paradox that has vexed me for my entire working life as a writer and as a citizen. How is it possible for a nation as diverse, as maddeningly contradictory as the United States to consider itself a single entity, a nation with a name? How can its kaleidoscopically diverse elements be recognizably American, each in themselves, and yet lend themselves to a term, American, that is definable only in terms of the tension among these elements? Even the nation's motto, a pluribus unum, from many, one, can be read in opposite ways, like one of those ambiguous optical illusions, by putting the weight of meaning either on the many or on the one. And neither of those readings is really wholly true, only the tension between the two readings. Stop me if I'm getting too abstract for you too early. But <laughs> so look, so the point is that these raids that I'm going to conduct uh, are plainly going to be conducted over swampy ground. Um, and sometimes covering the same track from different angles. I have found hints of a way of understanding this paradox in New Orleans, where I've lived for 24 years. Um, swampy ground, if ever there were swampy ground. If this 40-minute guerrilla war that I'm going to uh, engage in for you here has anything like a theme, it might be that New Orleans should be seen as a representative part of the American tradition of self-reinvention, transformation, and possibility. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin on the more or less solid ground of my own experience. New Orleans is a place uh, that I loved in my imagination from a very young age. When I was 11 years old on Long Island's South Shore, any South Shore people here? No Long Island people here? Oh, hell. OK, that's it. <laughs> No, no, I'll continue, I'll continue. So, all right, on the south shore of Long Island, it's sort of echt suburbia, Burger Kings and gas stations. But, um, where I was raised, my mother bought me a copy of a book called Jazz Men, uh, originally published in 1939 and reissued in a bright orange Harvest Books edition. I'd been interested in musical performance since the Beatles came to the US in early 1964 when I was eight. Uh, and like many others, I followed a trail of recordings and crumbs from the Beatles to Chuck Berry to Muddy Waters to Robert Johnson. And I think my mom uh, figured it was a short hop from there to jazz. In any case, um, Jazz Men, that book, uh, is a romantic depiction, depiction of jazz's early years, earliest years a collection of hagiographic essays on early jazz musicians such as King Oliver, Bix Beiderbecke, and Louis Armstrong, their working lives and recordings and travels. It contains a fantastic essay on collecting old 78 records in dusty antique stores in dirt road towns, and most important to me, a thick section of photographs in the middle. The grainy black and white images taken back in the 1910s and 1920s were mesmerizing. Bands led by men with names like <clears throat> Buddy Bolden and Bunk Johnson and Kid Ory, dressed in suits or band uniforms, holding trumpets and clarinets and trombones and banjos. These musicians were black and white, although only rarely did white and black musicians appear in the same photographs. Regardless of skin color, they gazed into the camera, through the camera, straight into posterity clearly sure of their own worth and place in the world. There were photos of buildings, too, archaic-looking dance halls and saloons and the occasional brothel with names like Luthjens and Tom Andersons and Big 25 and Mahogany Hall, streets full of light and shadow with names that were in themselves a poetry, Rampart, Perdido, Berg well, Burgundy, which we pronounce as Burgundy, uh, some even named for the Greek muses, Thalia, Euterpe, 
Terpsichore, Calliope, which in New Orleans you pronounce Calliope, by the way. <laughs> My grandparents uh, on either side, both sides, had come to America in the late 19-teens through Ellis Island, eyes firmly locked on the American dream, and yet never quite able to let go of the umbilicus uh, connecting them to the literal and figurative old country. They presided over long Sunday dinners with aunts and uncles, recycling ancient resentments and gossip, uh, and had endless conversations about this or that other cousin or uncle or neighborhood, speaking Italian about half the time. Yet at the same time that they held on to these ancient grudges and secret handshakes, they encouraged their children, my father's generation, to assimilate and lay claim to the possibilities afforded by this new country. Their bookshelves held inexpensive matched reprint sets of Hemingway, Steinbeck, and Mark Twain, as well as the 20 volumes of the Book of Knowledge with their imposing embossed oxblood colored faux leather bindings. The children, not just of the Italians, but the Irish and the Polish Catholics and the Eastern European Jews, took the cue and moved out after World War II, some of them anyway, from Brooklyn and Queens to the Long Island post-war suburbs where every immigrant could have the same house and bleach their ethnic complexion to the roughly the same hue. That seemed to be the idea anyway. So Long Island's South Shore, where my parents settled, with its endless stretches of department stores and Levittown-inspired tract housing developments, its yawning sky as yet uninterrupted by big trees or interesting-looking buildings, represented an aggressively asserted version of normalcy after the unimaginable sacrifices and hardships and heartbreaks of the Second World War, a promised land for many of those who had lived through it, uh, black and white, although obviously coming down more heavily on the white side. But it was an eerily affectless and rootless landscape to a generation of adolescents who came of age there, myself included. Those photos and jazz men became for me a kind of treasure map, a set of clues to what might be possible in life, a taproot into a past that could nourish the present and future in ways I could not yet imagine, but which I could feel. Uh, like the tangy air of coming springtime. Two. This is the second raid. This is a series of raids. New Orleans is often characterized as a special case kind of place uh, within the United States. We talked about this a bit, Joe and, and Crystal and I. Somehow not entirely American, partly European, partly Caribbean, Caribbean, divorced or at least amicably separated from the supposed American ethos of hard work, rugged individualism, and capitalist venality. This is not entirely inaccurate, but it is most certainly incomplete at best. New Orleans is, in my view, a quintessentially American place, one which reflects and embodies the tensions and ironies, the survival strategies, and the as yet unhealed and inadequately addressed wounds of the nation as a whole. New Orleans, with its exposed roots in France, in Spain, in Africa, has offered a model not of cultural assimilation, that mythic and monstrous melting pot that we all hear about, but rather a cultural polyphony. The city has fashioned a collective identity out of constituent national and ethnic identities, French, Italian, African, Spanish, German, Irish, uh, the list is too long to continue. The food, the music, the architecture are famously amalgams of all the distinct identifiable ethnic components and yet also unmistakably New Orleans. This construction of what might be called a cultural identity out of the tension among wildly various pre-existing cultural identities is nothing if not a paradox, generating an endless series of complications and variations moray patterns that summon a reality far more complex and richly textured than any of their component parts. And I think much the same thing might be said about the country as a whole. Three, America has never quite settled for itself where it stands in relation to the question of inherited position of whatever variety versus social and cultural mobility. The nation as a whole, and New Orleans in particular, 
afford the freedom and sometimes the necessity of switching identities, assuming alternative identities. At the same time, they advance a counterbalancing emphasis on the centrality and dominance of old families and other types of lineage. On the one hand, the injunction to recreate yourself, expand your horizons, go west, innovate. On the other, a sharply articulated awareness of family background, class privilege, ethnicity, race, gender identifiers. This emphasis is asserted the more strongly in proportion to the social flux amid which it exists, and it can be found across the class and ethnic spectrum. The DAR, Mayflower descendants, the social register, the old line families of New Orleans, of Boston, of every major city, as well as all the urgent identifiers involved in what is usually referred to as identity politics and the abrupt rise in hunger for DNA evidence of genetic background. Ancestry.com should really be called identity.com. Uh, now, who, does anybody know the story, Nathaniel Hawthorne's story, My Kinsman Major Molyneux? Anybody know that one? Ah, oh, great, I got to turn you on to a good story. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, My Kinsman Major Molyneux, oh man, you gotta read this, it's, it's one of the great American stories, follows a young man from the countryside named Robin uh, as he arrives in a certain little metropolis of a New England colony in search of a supposedly wealthy relative who's gonna set him up, kind of install him in a position and endow him with privilege that he hasn't earned himself. He hasn't, he's very young, he hasn't had a chance to earn this position, but he thinks this uh, kinsman of his is going to, you know, hook him up. Uh, this is all fine with our young man, but as he walks the streets inquiring as to where he might find his kinsman, Major Molyneux, he is met with hostility and ridicule. Uh, until finally a wise and helpful spirit invites Robin to wait with him on the street with the promise that Robin's kinsman will soon pass by, and he does, the major does. Uh, born on a litter by a wild mob, got up in crazy garb with faces painted with wild music by torchlight, uh, and he's been tarred and feathered. Uh, as the joke sinks in for Robin, the folly of leaning too heavily on the expectation that his antecedents, his inherited identity, will make his way for him instead of having to create it for himself, his wise companion enjoins him not to leave and go back to the country, but to remain in town where he, quote, may rise in the world without the help of your kinsman, Major Molyneux. Remake yourself. Live with the joke. Sustain tension between the hand you were dealt and what you make of it. Improvisation is the word for making your own variations upon a set of givens. And America has been an improviser's culture. Nothing if not an improviser's culture. The nation grew out of the need to use and transform what was to be found here. Uh, in a landscape not just geographical but social and economic, and the culture advances this myth of improvisation in countless ways, from the comic to the tragic end of the spectrum. The leaving of home in search of a dream, an elusive prize that often turns out not to be worth it, or an illusion, as in uh, Bobby Bear's great performance of the song Detroit City. Anybody know that song? Ah, oh, look at you guys. <laughs> okay, I hope you all are taking notes. You need to go check this stuff out. Uh, Detroit City, it's great. It's this song that's sung in the persona of uh, a guy who uh, has left his home down south and goes up north to work in the factories in Detroit. And he says, by, by day I make the cars, by night I make the bars. Hey, okay. And, th and then there's this refrain in it of, I want to go home. I want to go home, you know. Gee, but I want to go home. Thank you. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But, you know, uh, that refrain of I want to go home, it lives underneath American song and literature consistently as it became more and more American. Chorus underneath, all the restless traveling and optimistic bluster. It's there as an ostinato of sorts. The voyage may be the traveling north from a south short on opportunity, or the leaving of the east with its establishment norms, heading for the frontier of the west with all of its possibilities and its dangers. Or it could be Nick Carraway leaving the Midwest for New York with all of its own Gatsby-esque promises and dangers, the old paradigm 
so often to be found in European novels, certainly of the provincial coming to the city to make his way upward, literally and figuratively. A novel saved from an excessive reliance on the European model by the resoundingly symbolic invention of Gatsby with his insatiable hunger. Our two greatest American novels contain multitudes. Huckleberry Finn, of course, with its improvising protagonist who just wanted to go somewhere he weren't particular. And his encounter with the grand array of riverfront con men and masqueraders in the company of Jim an enslaved person who is making his own gamble on freedom and whose fate is inextricably bound up with Hux. And then there's Moby Dick, with its Pequod populated by every imaginable nationality and ethnic group, presided over by Ahab and his monomaniacal quest for something unattainable, domination over nature, over life itself, a mania that leads to doom. In Twain's book, Everything Turns Out Okay, and in Melville's book, everything ends in shards and splinters. Which vision prevails? We hang suspended between both. Four, the novelist Ralph Ellison once remarked that the search for identity is the American theme. He gave that search a form in his novel, Invisible Man, which we talked about today in class. Uh, in which the narrator and central character lacks a name as well as a fixed identity, excuse me, and is constantly looking to other people and external situations to lend him one. And yet the word search feels problematic to me with its implicit positioning of identity as a fixed goal, something findable, pre-existing, awaiting discovery, the novel's protagonist never does disembark at some safe harbor of a found or even a constructed identity, after all. Only calls a supposedly temporar temporary truce with that goal, as if on the next try he might emerge from his underground hole and finally grasp it, create the uncreated features of his face in his twist on Stephen Dedalus' desire to create the uncreated conscience of his race. But perhaps the idea of that search itself is not just elusive, but a mistake, an error in perception. Perhaps identity in the American sense, the broadest American sense, involves not so much the search for, much less the discovery of, the single pre-existing role awaiting one, some final secure off-the-rack identity or even the creation of a single definitive face for oneself, as it does the constant transformation of the given, the conversion of objects into subjects, the act of creative argument with one's own assumptions. I would say that identity is to be located in the nature and quality of that transformation, that conversion, that argument, a dynamic engagement with it all, a kind of hologram created by energies pointed in different directions. In an essay on Bob Dylan, who I think is one of the most representative American artists who's ever done it, uh, in my collection, Devil Sent the Rain, I said I wasn't an essayist, but it's an essay collection. <laughs> it's also got some journalism in it. Examining the extraordinary variety of American utterance and reference to which Dylan laid and lays still claim, I tripped on the word American and the word America a couple times, and I wrote this. America, meaning what again? Cowboys and Indians? New York City? Hollywood? The Civil War? The CIA? Interstate highways? Main Street? Walmart? John Wayne, John Wayne Gacy, Earl Scruggs, Muhammad Ali, Rosa Parks, Don Rickles, Flacco Jimenez, Edmund Wilson, Redwood Forest, Gulfstream Waters, Ellis Island, Los Alamos. America wants to include all possibility, hence it takes up potentially all the space there is. It expands. Something so internally contradictory is, of course, a target for every kind of projection. The mind has trouble accepting such intense contradictions within the same entity. Their presence creates a profound anxiety. 
learning to accept them as a discipline. To identify with the culture itself means identifying with a high level of tension among elements. It means identifying with the tension itself. Five. Hmm. It's going to be a long lecture. So. Five. In The Birth of Tragedy, Friedrich Nietzsche sets out his famous notion of what he calls the Apollonian and Dionysian aspects of human nature, positing a fruitful tension between them. Roughly and somewhat over, simply put, the Apollonian tendencies are those that pull in the direction of order, measure, hierarchy, and individuation. And the Dionysian or Dionysian aspects represent the tendency toward dissolution of a distinct self in communal orgiastic activity and altered states that exist, to use his phrase, beyond good and evil. On one side, morals, ethics, moderation. On the other, impulse, excess, unregulated passion. He also states, if I read him correctly, that the two sets of impulses exist in a kind of corrective relationship one to the other. American culture has always struggled to maintain its balance on this fault line like a tightrope walker, constantly making micro and sometimes macro corrections. If any single place in the United States de uh, distills the essence of the contrast and tension between the Apollonian and the Dionysian, it would be New Orleans. And never more fully than at Mardi Gras time, when the entire community, almost, uh, participates in both the Dionysian loosening of moral ligature in masking, drinking, eating, and doing all the other stuff we know about. And at the same time, the Apollonian reenactments of traditions and pageantry that go back well into the 19th century, and really in some cases before that, often in detail scripted down to the smallest hand gesture, literally. Whether we see bank presidents who wear hoods unhappily reminiscent of Klan outfits riding on lavishly decorated floats in the crew of Rex, the always white king of carnival, or the grand mirroring mockery of the 100 plus year old African American social club Zulu, with its own king and court, consisting primarily of the city's black bourgeois elite, dressed in parody, bitter parody, of supposedly African garb, grass skirts, and blackened faces, or the Mardi Gras Indians, made up primarily of working class African Americans who roam the streets wearing extraordinary handmade suits and singing songs and performing ritualized gestures that go back again well into the 19th century is the mask that endows the individual with the ability to transcend the given and emerge into the possibility of transformation. In either case, this transformation is sanctioned, understood as a necessary element in managing and mediating energies that might otherwise break loose and do lasting damage to the social order. This dissolution of the day-to-day -day self or rather the substitution of another self that exempts one from the usual responsibilities and guidelines of social standing, propriety, station, location, affiliation, is understood by all concerned to be an assumed identity, a mask that transforms you. Six, while all this is recognizable as characteristically New Orleans, we should also understand that masking is not just a perennial but a defining element of American culture as a whole. It's of course true that masking uh, is part of the cultural fabric in most places in the world in ritual enactment and celebration. But it has served important additional purposes here in our mythology-drenched cultural landscape where social position, <clears throat> excuse me, ethnic background, gender identity, even the mass appetite for team sports may be understood as a form of masking, a shadow play of identity. It has been a way of encoding or channeling aspiration, doubt, guilt, even unspeakable desire, and has often in itself served as a passport to social mobility. Members of marginalized groups have often found it necessary or desirable to become virtuosos of the mask. Whether Jewish Americans who have passed for Gentiles or African Americans with skin light enough to allow them to, quote, pass for white, in both cases as a way of opening doors of opportunity for themselves and their families that might otherwise have remained closed. The masquerade can go both ways, of course. 
The foundation of a recognizable indigenous American musical performance was blackface minstrelsy, uh, the most peculiar institution of American culture in the 19th century, and well into the 20th, be it said, uh, the rock and roll of its time. In fact, <clears throat> white performers blacken their faces with burnt cork and perform stylized and often, as I said this in class, viciously caricatured impressions of supposed black types, whether devious or carefree, and scenes of idyllic life on the old plantation. This entertainment found its first mass audience in the North, where the scenes of blacks portrayed as either simple-minded or criminal eased the collective white mind somewhat about being complicit in the perpetuation of slavery. It would be nearly impossible to overstate minstrelsy's influence on the course of American popular entertainment. Sam Phillips, the charismatic founder of the legendary Memphis record label, record company Sun Records, said sometime around 1954, 1955, find me a white man who can sing like a Negro and I'll make a million dollars. And when he discovered Elvis Presley, he made his million and more and more. Um, but 100 years before that, white men singing supposedly like Negroes dominated the entertainment world. The assuming of the mask of blackness endures today in every white suburban high school kid who imitates the gestures and accents of rappers homie, that mask of blackness allowing the expression of attitudes and modes of expression otherwise considered unacceptable in so-called proper, i.e. white society. But blackface, blackface performance was not the only form of ethnic masking that became wildly popular in the US, far from it. Uh, the early 20th century, with its mass influx of immigrants from southern and eastern Europe, was a rich time for ethnic impersonation. Vaudeville drew upon a gallery of stock characters based on ethnic stereotypes, and in fact provided an entrance ramp from which so many German, Irish, Jewish immigrants made their way into the American entertainment mainstream like cars entering a fast-moving interstate. Jewish performers especially have been ballet masters of this kind of masking. Often this entree actually came from carrying on the minstrel tradition, as the singer Al Jolson did in full blackface singing songs like Mammy, both on stage and in the first popular talking picture, The Jazz Singer, released in 1927. Songwriter Irving Berlin, who was Jewish, providing a mostly Christian nation with its holiday anthem, White Christmas. All the way to Bob Dylan, born Robert Zimmerman, Bob Dylan's appropriation of everything he liked, from ancient Anglo-Irish ballads through country blues, rock and roll, lyric poetry, and more. Saul Bellow once remarked that you are entitled to steal anything in writing that you are strong enough to carry out. Freedom suggests itself as the readiness to adopt as many masks as possible. Seven. New Orleans has been called the land of dreams in songs like Basin Street Blues and Way Down Yonder in New Orleans, but has anyone ever defined that much abused formulation, the American dream? A thing devoutly to be wished, apparently, a protean set of possibilities that everyone defines for himself or herself. Out of what an uneasy sleep such a dream might come. In any organized social context, one leads a double life at least, as both a private individual and a member of the society. In the United States, each individual carries the weight of responsibility for the fate of the democratic enterprise itself. This noble, flawed experiment in which we are engaged. Huckleberry Finn tries to escape it for most of a novel, but is finally forced into assuming responsibility for his choice regarding the fate of his friend, the escaped slave Jim. In Moby Dick, the men on the Pequod maintain their varied individual aspects while performing their duties as seamen, their limited responsibility for the collective enterprise, as that enterprise is hijacked by the unstable genius, Captain Ahab, a commander-in-chief driven by revenge, walking the deck alone at all hours, accepting no counsel, tweeting from his cabin in the middle of the night. Oops, sorry. I Got my commanders mixed up for a moment. 
To me, New Orleans is the American dream writ large in day-glow colors, and it takes the word dream literally in that it advances in symbolic form images meant to embody not just possibilities, <clears throat> hidden yearnings, hungers, and needs, but also warnings of danger, perhaps too deep and threatening to face straight on. What could be more dreamlike, more symbolic, and more troublingly American than the uproar around the removal of the stone effigies of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee from the perches where they were set up over a century ago, <clears throat> ago to remind the citizenry of a white supremacy that seemed lost during Reconstruction, but that had been reclaimed quickly by the oh-so-brave men riding masked in hoods to reassert white dominance. What could be more dreamlike than individuals from inside and outside the city watching the removals dressed in Confederate flag bandanas and Yes We Can t-shirts with Barack Obama's likeness on them, youths in army fatigue jackets with peace symbols and motorcycle guys with denim vests carrying automatic weapons. You saw all of it if you were there, which I was. You would think that the Civil War had never been settled and that the fate of the Union still hangs in the balance. And it does. It does. We've entered a time now in which the word American has been hijacked by thieves in suits and flag lapel pins who assert that America means white people, not people of color, straight nuclear family people, not gay or transgender people, and certainly not immigrants, while they rob the country blind under the cloak of law and order with a sociopathic six-year-old at the helm, madder by far than Captain Ahab attempting to push large groups of Americans and aspiring Americans to the margins, often by executive orders that would write them out of the very definition of American. Black lives, women's lives, lives of the appropriately named dreamers, all of whom find it necessary to insist as a means of their very survival on their distinct identities. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, wrote Yeats, of course, in The Second Coming. And perhaps it is not mere anarchy, but a carefully crafted shadow play of mass distraction, allowing a small percentage of vested brigands to steal the silver and gold. In the introduction to Devil Sent the Rain, my essay collection, speaking of developments during the George W. Bush administration, I wrote the following. The divisions that were being wedged more and more deeply into the national dialogue were psychological, even mythological. What were once differences of policy and even philosophy had become coated with magic and superstition. Manipulations cunningly crafted to bypass the reasoning faculty and go right to the heart of the fear and uncertainty that were there under the crust like rich oil reserves that could be tapped to fuel a brutal expansion. The question became whether there was an opposing magic to counteract the enormous undertow of all that imagery, all that appeal to easy, comforting answers." End quote. And that was written about a time 10 years ago and more amid a landscape of discourse that was downright Athenian compared to the slop bucket we're in now. Is there a cure? Must things fall apart? I asked myself that question after Katrina, revisiting the broken city, my home, that I loved and that many wanted to write off, but that needed to be fought for. Could New Orleans offer not just a dream warning for the nation, but a dream hint of a way forward? Eight. I hit my stride as a fiction writer and maybe as an improviser, on my first trip to New Orleans in 1987. I had landed in town to spend a week trying to recover from a broken heart and to attend the Jazz and Heritage Festival, which I had wanted to do for years. On arrival, I found that my accommodations were going to be different than I thought. I was either going to have to share a bed with the proprietor of the guest house that I had booked eight, uh, that I had booked sight unseen from some sketchy advertisement. I should say this is before, for those of you uh, undergraduate age, 
this was before the internet. This was before you know Airbnb, HomeAway, uh, Expedia, whatever it might be. This was like you looked in like advertisements, and it was like closing your eyes and throwing a dart, really. Which, though proffered as an option, uh, what I mean, sharing the bed with the proprietor, uh, was not one as far as I was concerned. Or to sleep on a folding cot in the kitchen, where I had spotted several cockroaches that resembled good-sized cigar butts, only ambulatory. <laughs> it took a moment or three to wrap my brain around the situation. This was not the New Orleans groove that I had imagined. But as if one set of assumptions were being slid off of me, uh, like a decal, and another Sid slid into place, I thought, no, nah, man, you wanted to come to New Orleans. This is what it is. This is the hand you've been dealt. Deal with it or don't deal with it. And I thought, I'll deal with it. So I slept in the kitchen. And the next night, a bona fide guest room opened up as if by magic. But for me, the project of writing, I'm sorry, the process of writing a novel is very much like this. You have one set of ideas when you embark, and a provisional sense of the map of the book, maybe. But as you get into it and find out that certain things are less possible than you thought they were, and characters reveal aspects of themselves that you didn't anticipate, you have to go with that. You have to improvise a response to the unforeseen, and out of a series of such responses, your book begins to find its identity. I don't know that all writers work this way, but I, in fact, I'm sure they don't. But I do think that most literary writers probably do. Was it just a total coincidence that I found my first voice as a fiction writer on my first visit to New Orleans? I don't know, maybe. But I sat at the Napoleon House and wrote the first draft of my first good short story, Brownsville. By the way, my first, that was the first one I wrote where I really actually felt coordinated, you know. Um, Wrote the first draft of my first short story, Brownsville. And in fact, when I sent it in to Gordon Lish, great editor, sort of legendary editor, Gordon Lish, used to edit fiction for Esquire and other places. When I sent it in to Gordon Lish's magazine, The Quarterly, I sent it in under a pseudonym, an assumed identity, a mask, if you will. I will not tell you what it is, uh, because I might need it again someday. <laughs> Uh, leave it uh, that I had literally found another way to be myself, if self is even really the right word. But New Orleans would teach me many more lessons in years to come. Some lessons were welcome and some were not. But even the unwelcome ones proved to be useful as I improvised my responses. And one of the lessons, maybe the most important, was that rarely is anything exactly what it seems on first glance. So let me tell you a little story about that to close out this lecture. Shortly after I arrived in New Orleans uh, to live, which was in 1994, after years of visiting every chance I could find, I made the acquaintance of a Mardi Gras Indian chief named Donald Harrison, Big Chief Donald Harrison. Somebody's nodding their head. Big Chief of the Guardians of the Flame Tribe. Um, can I reasonably assume that most of you know what Mardi Gras Indians were? By the way, I should ask. Do, do, can, raise your hand if you don't know. I want to see. If you don't know. OK. All right, don't be afraid. If you don't. OK, good. Everybody knows. Terrific. So Donald Harrison uh, was the chief of this particular gang. He's also the father of the wonderful jazz saxophonist Donald Harrison Jr. Uh, anyway. So you know the Mardi Gras Indians, gangs of African Americans who spend most of every year sewing elaborate feathered costumes that they wear for the first time on Mardi Gras Day, and then only a couple more times afterward, and making a new one the next year and so forth. The tradition goes well back into the 19th century, as I said before. Their visual impact is often overwhelming, as is the sound of their chanted songs and rhythmic accompaniment. I wish we had some film footage to show right now, but... There's plenty in Treme, for sure. I no longer remember exactly how I met Chief Donald, although I had seen him dressed in one of his astonishing suits, assemblages like all Mardi Gras Indian suits consisting of feathers and beaded pictorial patches sewn onto canvas and jewels and geometric arrangements, explosions of glorious invention and grandeur. Whatever the circumstances, I must have expressed an interest in talking to him about the Indians, and he with a very characteristic New Orleans generosity of spirit, invited me to meet him for a drink at a bar in the Treme, 
uh, by some accounts, the oldest continuously occupied African-American neighborhood in North America, in New Orleans, just across Rampart Street from the French Quarter. It's where it begins. So I showed up and waited for him for about half an hour until through the bar's gloomy half-light, I saw him approaching a very different figure from the one I had last seen decked out in powder blue plumes and feathers engaged in a verbal duel with some other Indian chief. This was a trim man in a very natty jacket and stingy brim pork pie hat. He greeted me and we fell easily into conversation. And this is how I described the encounter in my book, Why New Orleans Matters. Rather than try to strain to recast it for you, I'll just tell you how it goes. I said, we chatted for a while about this and that. He asked me what kind of work I did, and I told him that I write books. He asked me what kind, and I told him both fiction and nonfiction, and that I wrote a lot about music as well. I asked him if he liked to read, and he told me he did. When I asked him what he liked to read, he said, mainly philosophy and some fiction. I have an extensive library of books on philosophy and African American history as well. This surprised me. I thought I knew what and who the Mardi Gras Indians were. And I was surprised to hear this man, whom I had seen dressed in elaborate Indian regalia, plumes and feathers sprouting, chanting African-based rhythms over tambourine background, say that he read philosophy. To my shame, I had a moment of skepticism that lay beneath my next question, which was, which philosophers do you like to read? Lately, he said, mainly Bertrand Russell, but I love Nietzsche, too. It's an old American situation, of course. Anyone interested in an extended essay on the subject should read Ralph Ellison's The Little Man at Chihaw Station in his collection Going to the Territory, or Constance Rourke's seminal book-length study, American Humor. By the way, I want to recommend that book to you. It's dated in some respects. It came out in 1931. Constance Rourke is one of the most unjustly neglected cultural historians uh, who's ever done that thing, and her book American Humor is indispensable. In fact, I learned about it from Ralph Ellison and his friend Albert Murray, uh, also a Tuskegee-educated uh, novelist and nonfiction writer. Anyway, both of these books extended meditations on the masks not just that we put on for others, but that we put on others. It's a lesson that one has to learn continually in New Orleans. It's the end of the quote. And I would add, in our lives as Americans, improvising our way through a continuously evolving landscape of possibility and identity. And I'm going to leave it there. And now I'll improvise some responses to questions <laughs> or remarks, if you have any. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, any remarks, anything to, any balls to serve me over the net? I'll hit it back if I can. Okay, yes. What's your connection now between jazz and the act of writing? Ha. Huh. The question for, if you couldn't hear, was what's my connection between jazz and the act of writing? You said, yeah. Well, that's, there are probably a few different ways I could answer that. Um, and they all probably go back to the idea of improvisation, although I don't consider jazz to be strictly an improvisatory form. I think improvisation is inextricably bound up with jazz music. Um, for me, I can answer it maybe in two or three parts. For one thing, um, my notion of the, act, of the process of generating a fictional narrative is, is very improvisatory, to wit, I usually have some kind of provisional sense when I start out of what the chord changes will be. By the way, the person who asked this question is a dear old friend of mine who I have not seen for probably 40 years, Brian Torf, who's one of the finest American bass players, great jazz bass player, and other genres. So that's uh, where that question comes from. So the chord changes, in effect, you know, one might have a sense that one's going to, you know, one thinks one's going to start out playing. Uh, you know, I'll remember April, and you find out you're really playing Stardust. You know, and, but you have to get into the text to find that out. So the process of composition 
entails constantly being alive to the things that are being suggested to you by the text that you've already generated. Okay? So it's improvisatory in that sense. And then, of course, one has the luxury, if one's a fiction writer, of going back and rewriting, which, of course, Sonny Rollins doesn't have. Um, so, so, it's, so there's that. Second of all, and I, I guess I'm going to have to paraphrase something I was saying in response to one of the students in the class this afternoon. I, I experience the writing of prose in a musical way, and even in a kind of choreographic way, in a sense, which is that one is dealing with the manipulation. That's a, I don't like the overtone series of that particular word, but one's dealing, yes, with the manipulation of the passage of time and the nature of sequence and the fact of sequence, which is every bit as important in writing fiction as it is in five card stud poker where you roll the cards one at a time. You're trying to set up expectations and then either subvert them or satisfy them in some kind of surprising and agreeable way and, and coherent way. Well, the same thing could be said about playing a jazz solo or playing in a jazz group. But specifically with the sentences and the progress of paragraphs, one is, one can spend, you know, an entire Ulysses on one day in Dublin or one can, you know, also uh, go through you know, 30 years in a paragraph. So that is the manipulation of time. There's that wonderful, there's a great performance by John Coltrane. Any jazz fans in the house? People like jazz? A couple, two people? Don't be ashamed to raise your hands. <laughs> Stick up for jazz music. Well, there's a great recording by John Coltrane called Blue Train. It's the title of an album and of a track on the, as a blues. And uh, in it, Train at certain Coltrane at certain places was, would be playing many, many notes over a, it's, a, it's a walking tempo blues about like this, maybe right about there. And sometimes he's playing melodies that go sort of like that, maybe 30 second notes or whatever they are. And then he'll start playing eighth notes and quarter notes. And it's as if, it's again a metaphor I used in class today, but it's as if at a certain point there's stuff going by a train window so fast that it's a blur and then suddenly you come out into open country and you see a farmhouse, whatever. So I can't help that kind of synesthetic uh, dimension of writing prose, narrative prose specifically. And I find it uh, actually a very tenable analog to playing jazz. Does that answer the question? <laughs> okay, man. Sure. Who else? Do I have to ask myself questions? Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Tom. This was great for your talk. I, I want to set you a problem and you can refuse it. But, hmm, um, that's quite a lead in. Okay. Uh, uh, well, it's about improvisation. Okay. Uh, and the, Treme is such a romantic association for a particular neighborhood. But New Orleans is a conglomeration of many neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what would happen if, if we set you the Past, just throw out other neighborhoods and if different storylines, because it's a multi plotted series with all kinds of different places and people activated, but what difference of emphasis it would be if the series were called Bywater or Middleton or Midtown or Fober of Mary? Just that? What an interesting question. Did everybody hear it, basically? Okay, what if you heard it? All right, so I won't try to recapitulate. Basically, what if the series were called, you know, named for some other neighborhood in New Orleans? How could that, even though it takes, even though Treme takes in all many, many different, the series addressed itself to many different places in New Orleans, what if the accent were placed on a different syllable and it were named for a different neighborhood? I think, in a way, well, what is a title in the first place? A title is some, serves some kind of a uh, god function, doesn't it? In that <laughs> a, title, you know, a title is related to a text the way God is related to a 
creation in one way at least, which is to say it addresses itself or sheds light upon, looks over the entire scope of the narrative that it applies to. So in that sense, a title functions almost like a bit of a creation myth. So you're saying, here is the root of meaning in this text. Okay. So if you were to title uh, the, the series Bywater, right away you're writing about something. Now it may take in every neighborhood, but you're saying the wellspring of meaning is the experience of people who, and institutions that, you know, come, that are peculiar to this area, this neighborhood. If you were to title it French Quarter, you know, that's been done. Uh, or if you were to title it any one, you know, Lower Nine, pardon me, sorry. Or if you were to title it, uh, you know, Gentilly. Each one of these titles would suggest that somehow the experience or the fact of this particular lineage of experience is somehow going to cast a light that encompasses everything else. So you'd have a completely different creation myth in a sense. Now with Treme, the, the, and I did not title the series, uh, and I've, I've never been convinced that it was necessarily absolutely the ideal title for the series. But whatever. For one thing, because people kept, kept asking me if I wrote for Treme, you know, <laughs> you know is, that a uh, is that a soda or what, you know, anyway. But so, whether it was the, whether it was the ideal title or not, um, I think what it was saying, being that it was this historically ancient, really, African-American settlement, neighborhood within New Orleans, uh, it is saying something about African-American culture in New Orleans as being foundational to the city and fructifying uh, to all the different narratives in all parts of the city. Uh, that may be an impossibly romantic view of it, but I don't think it's completely off the wall. So anyway, so, and I think that's what would change. We can't go, I don't want to go through all the different possible, you know, uh, param permutations of, uh, but, but that's, I think, how it would change. That's the nature of how it would change. That's an improvised answer. <laughs> it was all right? Okay. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. So, okay, this is great. Thank you. Sure. No, no. Go, well, okay. um, um, I want to think about... Um, so I, I love thinking about improvisation. And I guess maybe I just want you to say a little more, improvise a little more improvisation. And what do you mean by improvising identity? And I'll just, you know, when I saw the title, as an occupational hazard, the two like phenomena that I thought of were sex and teaching. Were what? Sex and teaching. Like the, the, the sort of two, two, two things, things that shouldn't be combined a whole lot, uh, necessarily. Yeah. Except that I think of, as you said, sort of jazz as not entirely an improvisatory form. I thought that's true about two events. That contradiction in terms is true of everything. I mean, there's always some kind of form. Yeah. Like, teaching is just sort of endlessly exhausting, endlessly exhausting, improvising sometimes, and and of course sex. But also there's the there's there's a, there's a form so that that can sort of happen outside of certain range is no longer teaching, and you know it's no longer sex. It's like sexual assault or it's whatever else it is. So I guess whatever I'm going on a tangent. The point is, I wonder like one like what do you what exactly do you mean by improvising? Is what is masking an example of in this in the talk and. You know, what do you think of as the kind of interplay between form and improvisation when it comes to identity? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a multi-part question. So what are some examples of masking in the talk? Well, How, what, is, what is masking supposed to be an example of in the talk? Because I take it, I take it improvisation allows a kind of liquidity to identity that, that you know, searching or locating or, you know, finding identity. Sure. And, and so what is, is masking an example, the good, the good kind of masking an example of improvising identity? Well, I think it always entails, masking, I think, probably always entails uh, an injunction to improvising, be to, to improvise because you're going to find yourself in an unaccustomed situation. You know, I mean, unless it's the same mask you wear every week, you know, uh, but even then, even then. Now, of course, we find ourselves in unscripted situations even when we're not, quote unquote, wearing a mask, but a lot of times, a mask is put on you. I mean, you know, we're constantly measuring the temperature of any situation, the slant of light in any situation. How does this person see me? What are the assumptions this person has? I walk into this room as a person that I have my own understanding, maybe provisional, of who I am. I walk into this room as a bunch of people who are going to have certain class assumptions about me, or certain ethnic assumptions, you know. So we're constantly improvising our responses 
to these situations. One of the things that masks can do is allow you to control that a little bit more. Like, okay, I understand what this Frankenstein mask is going to say to a number of people. I see they're going to see it as a, you know, a quotation about a monster movie. It's how so they can be relating to the mask while I'm doing something else. This is one of the great advantages of masking. You know, like for instance, you could have a president, let's say, who was a complete swindler, deadbeat, uh, really mentally deficient, you know, and, and really out to bilk everybody from every last dollar that they have, if he could, but who presents himself as a great populist. Hey, you know these guys, blah, blah, blah. That's, you know, so people who want to see that mask, you can use that mask to manipulate and steal the silver, you know. And we're living through that now, in my opinion. But so a mask, in other words, I think allows you to control the circumstances of the improvisation in a way, and maybe to a degree, that you wouldn't be able to if you just came out as yourself. Because after all, even our sense of our own selves is very fragmented most of the time. We don't, you know, we talk very glibly about who we are, myself, this is who I am, this is my identity. Your identity is about 12 or 14 different things at any given time anyway. You know, you're one person, I mean, this is a dull thing to say, it's so obvious and we've said so often, but, you know, we're different people with our parents, with our friends, blah, 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 lovers, whatever. Um, so, the nature of improvisation to me is just presence, finally, and a quality of alertness to the implications of what is being dealt you at that time. Now, were you saying you wanted an example of masking from the... No, no, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> but does this make sense, what yeah, I'm saying? Does that adequately address what you were raising? Yeah. Will, did you have something you were yeah, going to ask? Yeah, I was just saying, um, this reminded me uh, a lot of like an exhibit I saw at the Jazz Museum. It was part of like the P4 theme this year, which was like, it was called The Lotus in Spite of the Swamp. But it was actually an exhibit on the Mardi Gras Indians, and at the beginning they had a, like a short poem by... Um, I, it's Kalamu Yasalam yes, from yes, sure. the Ninth Ward. And I, just a quote that he had is that um, New Orleans is both and rather than either or. And so <laughs> I feel like this resonates with your, um, like with your talk. And I was just wondering, do you think, like, I, you might not be able to answer this question, but my question is, what do you think kind of the source of that identity is in New Orleans? Do we think it's just an accident of history, kind of the fact that in many ways the oldest people in New Orleans are not the Americans, but the Creoles, and then also in Southern Louisiana, the Cajuns, and the people from the Caribbean, et cetera. And therefore, um, you know, to be the truest New Orleans is not necessarily to be the truest American, or is it something that has developed uniquely, like in, in the subsequent years? <laughs> what, a, what a question. Well, or, yeah, it's a question. There are so many things that are germane to New Orleans history that where you could say, well, here's the historical reason why this kind of thing developed in this way. And I don't, I don't have enough of the actual factual history at my fingertips where I could say, well, here was the thing. When the Germans settled this neighborhood and so and so, so I can't approach the question from that angle. What I can say is that first and foremost, first and foremost, above everything else, New Orleans is a port. All right. So anytime you have a port, you have an extraordinary, extraordinarily heterogeneous population that is engaged in a lot of different kinds of activity, some of which is very opportunistic, some of which is, you know, exploratory. People are leaving, people are coming in who are strangers. You've got all the ingredients of every kind of story right there. The departure on an adventure, on a voyage of discovery, the arrival in town of the stranger. You've got it all mixed together. So every, all of these narratives, these different types of narratives, are mixing together in a, uh, you know, in an active port to a degree that they don't, let's say, in the sort of mythic small town, you know, in which there's a, a certain stasis and then it's disturbed a little bit by this or that irregularity of whatever sort. So New Orleans, First of all, even without anything else going on, is a port and it has all that kind of implied injunction to improvisation based on all these... Can I please get rid of this thing? 
the key thing. Sort of the, the, uh, what is this? I think it's for the, for you. Yeah, I think maybe leave. It has to be there. Okay. <laughs> hey, how you doing? All right. So, <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh yeah. Um, so it's an improvisatory situation to begin with, but especially because of the, first of all, it was, had this peculiar double quality of being one of the most active slave markets that there was, especially for a certain period, and at the same time as having a huge uh, population of free people of color. So right away, you're in, you're in a kind of hall of mirrors right away. Then you had neighborhoods that were settled successfully, successively by the French, by the Spanish. We know this. You know, other neighborhoods that were pockets of Italian. Very much, you know, New York shares some, New York City shares some of that uh, quality. So you have all that mixture of cultural richness and also mutual suspicion <laughs> and, and cultural blending, all of that stuff that comes from having a very diverse population um, in any situation. So all of that is there. Also, and I mean, I could go on, on and on about this, but one of the other things about New Orleans was that at specifically African and Afro-Caribbean, but, but specifically African cultural elements were maybe by an accident of uh, civic law or something, allowed to be expressed publicly in a way that they weren't in a lot of places. So though many of you have probably heard of Congo Square, which was this area in New Orleans right on one side of between, I guess, between Basin and, and Rampart Street, where enslaved people could go and play drums, African drumming, outside and dance uh, this is back even in, you know, the, the 18th century, in the 19th century. Uh, so what the ethnographers sometimes call African retentions were just out there, you know, in plain sight and were an animating, supremely an animating dimension of the city's cultural life, you know, from, from way back in way back. So I guess I'm losing the thread of the question maybe a little bit, but I, I take it that you're asking me why is New Orleans, why is New Orleans such a diverse place or something? You know, why is there such an uh, injunction to improvisation there? But I think any time that you have all that uh, cultural, historical, ethnic, whatever you want to say, uh, contrast, you're going to have that, and then specifically add to that the port city dimension and the fact that it was a French colony for a long time. You know, that too gave it this odd, this, this somewhat different cast. Many reasons. I suggest if you want to read an excellent book about New Orleans history, especially the early part of New Orleans history, uh, Tulane professor Lawrence Powell uh, wrote a book called The Accidental City. And that's, I think, probably the best history of early New Orleans that you could, that you could read. And uh, if you haven't read it, especially you being from New Orleans, you might want to check that out. Yes? To the man in the blue watch cap. <laughs> well, I was just wondering about if you could say more about, um, so you talked about New Orleans as the American dream writ large, but then you talked about it also, there are pretend warnings of dangers uh, mm. too threatening to consider. Mm. And I'm wondering, I, I don't know, I was, I was struck by that, uh, by that idea, and I wondered uh, if you had more to say about it. Um, uh, about climate disaster, for example, or about uh, the ways in which the fabric of the union might feels like it's being rent asunder. Uh, what? Yeah, tell, tell me, tell me what was going on in your mind when you were writing that. Like, what do you, what do you have to mention? Okay, I'll try to do that in as compact a time. Are we are we worried about time? Is it? No. Okay, fine. Good. So. When I said it was uh, kind of the American dream writ large, um, what I mean by that is that a broad spectrum of cultural affiliation is allowed an extraordinary uh, wide palette upon which to express. Each one is able to, you have French, Spanish, you have all of these ethnic, regional, national identifiers really 
being out there in full view, in full expression, vigorous full expression, and yet also at the same time contributing to these kind of syncretic forms that are combinations of these different you know, identifiable ethnic and whatever else uh, traditions. So to me, that is sort of the American dream. For me, that, that because I think the, the dream, which is not necessarily the reality, uh, God knows, all the time, is that we maintain a fruitful tension between where we came from you know, where, what, however you might want to read that, and what might be possible for us. Whether it's gender transformation, whether it's singing music from a completely different uh, tradition than ours. As Saul Bellow said, whatever you're strong enough to carry out, it's yours, you know, as long as you do something interesting with it. So, by American Dream, I suppose that's what I meant by that. Now, as far as warnings and dangers, well, I mean, you said it yourself. Um, we also see the American tendency, well, let, don't call it an American, it's a human tendency, to figure that we don't need to really be super proactive in our stewardship of uh, elements of, of the geography, physical or otherwise, that are meant to preserve our well-being, you know. So whether that's, oh, the levees, yeah, right, well, uh, I got to go home and watch the football game. I won't do the inspection today or whatever it might be. Whatever levels of incompetence or, or just bad attention uh, obtain. You, you know, we, we see that in New Orleans. New Orleans has suffered from that, from climate change all the way down to just about everything that you could think about about, about the city. Um, and, you know, initially I went before. I started to feel that the lecture was getting a little bit long, so I cut out a long section that I had quoting from Devil Sent the Rain in a piece that I wrote after the BP oil spill. Do you all remember the Deepwater Horizon? This was 2010, and the pipeline burst, and there were millions or billions, who's counting, gallons of uh, oil being shot out into some of the most ecologically sensitive waters on the planet. Um, and Everybody kept saying, oh, you poor guys down there. You know, first Katrina, now this. And I thought, what that was about was people not caring enough to make sure that there was safety precautions. Oh my God, regulation, God forbid. All right, so, and I thought, well, this is not a new, that's not you guys down there. Did, have you ever heard of Enron? Have you ever heard of WorldCom? Sorry, everybody's probably forgotten about that by now. Savings and loan scandal? Okay, you gotta be of a certain age. How about the fact that the entire world economy just about imploded in 2008 as a result of the loosening of the intolerable chains around the uh, limbs of the beleaguered uh, banking and uh, you know securities industries? I'm sorry, industry. You know, those regulations were so 1933. So, you know, and we got what we were asking for. But it's an, it's, and it's a, it's a human problem. But we have seen the spe specific action, I'm sorry, specific accent in which that problem has been articulated. And it's a very American accent. And I would say that New Orleans has shown us some of the most vivid waking dreams that could represent that danger that we've had. WorldCom, Enrod, all that stuff didn't offer these searing dreams to trouble the sleep of the republic. The New Orleans has, but they're representative. Yeah? That work for you? Yeah, it works for me. Okay. Everybody, I want to thank you so much. Thank you.